in ministry for 43 years, and he's been all over the place. Um, he has worked in churches in North Anvil, Clearfield, and Stewartstown, New York. He has worked in Ohio, and um, he was a district superintendent in Wellsboro. He served as conference director of Connection Ministries, and then went on to be the president of United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. Currently, Ed is the pastor here at St. Paul's, and loves being in the midst of the young people of Penn State, uh, doing mission projects and building partnerships. While in college, he worked as a youth pastor for three years and really enjoyed the retreat <coughs> at Mount Gretna. One of his favorite memories was taking a confirmation class to the mall to watch people and two of the confirmants almost getting arrested for shoplifting. Today, he enjoys time with his family, particularly going to Red Lobster, and his favorite food is lobster whenever he can get it. It is my privilege to introduce to you Ed Biters. certain assumptions, and then after I deal with those assumptions, we'll deal briefly with a conversation between St. Paul and his theological offspring, Timothy. When I get done with that, we'll talk about a few PowerPoint slides that I've made for us to consider, and then we'll be done. That will be about 11.15. Is that right? Is that what you said, Carol? <laughs> I want to bring greetings again from the Connectional Church. I think it's important to, that you see someone who has been around. This is uh, almost 44 years of this. And I'm grateful to God for the opportunity to serve in the ways in which the then Central Pennsylvania Conference, the then Eastern Conference of the United Methodist Church, and now the Susquehanna Conference have been a part of my life and made possible the dreams that I had when I was a kid. I want to make the assumption that all of you are currently leaders, and you may or may not be conscious of that. I want to make an assumption that all of you are participating actively in three expressions of ministry, whether you are conscious of it or not. One of those is you are participating now in pastoral forms of ministry when you care for other people well. How many of you are caring for others? Friendships, family members, colleagues, students. And you care deeply about others, you are already, by your baptisms, if you are baptized, participating in the fullness of the grace of God as leaders and as pastors. All of you already are participating in the priestly functions of the ministry by praying and interceding for the well-being of others you don't even know. If you have offered a prayer of intercession, of intercession, God be helpful, God intervene, God bring your peace, God restore hope to the world. You are a priest. You are living a sacramental life by bearing in your own bones the joy and the suffering of others. You are already priests. Do you believe it? is true. And in many ways, and I hope this is the case, but I can't predict it, but in many ways you are like Jeremiah, and you are like Moses, and you are like Holy Mother Mary, and you are like Elizabeth, you are like Ruth and Naomi. You are people of whatever age who are responding to the grace of God and standing in the world sometimes against it. You are already prophets. Isn't that good news? Now whether, as Greg illustrated, you have felt that penetrating finger of God in your chest, that I can't tell. What I do know is you will know when it happens. When the consciousness of the love of God becomes all the more apparent in your future. I was 12 when Mary Jane Starry and her husband Jim asked me to take leadership in the youth group at Park Street Church in Harrisburg. 
That was in 1954. Who was here in 1954? Let me see your hands. Only, yes, there are several of us who are so old that we actually brought our own dirt to creation. <laughs> 1954, Mary Jane said, I want you to preach that God has called you to preach, and I want you to preach on Sunday night at Park Street Church. And what I didn't know, but I know now, is that preaching in my congregation was a requirement for entrance into the youth fellowship. Everybody had to preach before they could be a member of the YF. So I am the 11th ministerial child of that congregation. Does that surprise you? Three of us are left. The others have died. But I'm grateful for those early years when people saw that already I was a priest. Already I was in pastoral ministry. Already I was a prophet, someone who had been given voice. Let me drag that little story. And Eric will laugh at this at the outset, I think. I hope. But in 2007, I said to Eric, I'm going to take him with me up to see the mayor of State College. Do you remember that? And I walked into the mayor's office, whom I had never met, Bill Welsh, who is now deceased. And as a prophet, priest, and pastor, we stand in the world, but we are not of it. That's one of the holy issues you have to come to grips with. We went up to the mayor's office, and Eric and I greeted him well, and he wanted to know what we were doing there. And I said, Greg, knocking on his door, you have to see me. You can't run this borough without me. What an awesome thing to say to somebody I just met. And I can't run and lead St. Paul's Church without you. We need each other to stand for the values and the value commitments that will change the course of history in this village. He said, well, I want you to know that I'm a lapsed Methodist. I said, I don't really care. And I don't, and I didn't. What I did care about was the forming of the alliances that make possible the transformation of the world. And to whatever extent the world is given to you, you are responsible already as an agent of God's love. Do you believe it? You are already an agent of God's amazing grace. One of my favorite biblical stories is the relationship between Timothy and St. Paul. Paul, you have to recognize, was earlier named Saul, yes? And Saul was a young rabbinic student who was being coached by an older scholar named Gamaliel. Gamaliel was brilliant. And young Saul took to heart that which Gamaliel taught him. Be faithful to God. Stand for the faith. Stand on behalf of the Holy Covenant in the world. And so it was. And Saul was finally converted. came to a new consciousness, a new awareness of how God in Christ loved him so much that it literally threw Saul, soon to be Paul, to the ground, and he came up a new man, and then he in his own life adopted another youngster, Timothy, and gave to Timothy that which he had gleaned himself as valuable. If you've never read those small epistles, Timothy, you must do it. My beloved Timothy, how I love you. Paul was then at the end of his journey, he was looking to hand it off to somebody, hand off the whole leadership of the church in the Mediterranean basin, and he chose a youngster to do it. Looking around over all the people that he could find who were faithful to God, he chose Timothy to give him this gift for significant leadership as a young person in the life of the church. Well, in about four years, I'm going to have to hand my journey off to somebody else, too. Who will it be? 
I playfully ask, who wants my library? Who wants the 3,000 volumes that have made my life rich in education? Anybody would like to have that? Raise your hand, also. It's, they're $10 a book, so it's <laughs> Who wants the papers that I've read and the things I've written? Who cares enough to receive that which our forebearers have done? Who cares? Well, I do. I have three children and three grandchildren, and I care enough. And I want them to know everything I know and believe everything I believe. I want them to see what I see. I want them to know the gospel of our God. And I want them to be fit vessels for the ministry of the Spirit. I want them to know already that they are priests and pastors and prophets when they hold care for their own offspring. It's going to come a day when you're going to have to hand your stuff off to somebody else too. Do you know that? And it comes more quickly than ever I thought. Well, I'm not 12 anymore. I'm about 16. In my mind, anyway. And I want you to turn your attention to what's going to be on the wall. This whole business of spiritual leadership, if it's a way for the moment of capturing what Moses revealed to you, and that which our friend Jeremiah revealed to you, it will be a helpful summary to help you sojourn your way forward. Read with me what's on the wall, a definition of spiritual leadership from Joel Parker. Let's try it. Ready? Spiritual leaders are claimed by God and trusted with God's mission and lead the people where they would not go on their own. We are obstreperous people. You know what that means? We block the influences of God. So when you are called, claimed, selected, pulled out of your old life and given the gift of the gospel of Christ, you recognize that God's claim is a sacred trust. Pulled apart, set apart for the glorious mission and trusted to the body of Christ. It is God's act to call you. It is not your act. It is God's act. And then that <laughs> act opens the door of your heart to all new possibilities, dreams, and visions, and encounters you've already been introduced to. They'll make all the difference in the world. But the people, in the biblical story, the people have always resisted the influences of the holy. How about you? Now think about this in short term. If you are indeed claimed of God for the holy mission of God, and you are entrusted with the well-being even of your own peers, have you ever wandered away from that claim? Have you ever turned your back on God? Yes? No? When we do, as Christian leaders, other people suffer the consequences. It's not just about you and me, it's about the collected us. When we are called of God into the ministries of the gospel, it is about the collected us. We live together as peculiar people. Let's move on to the next slide. Spiritual leaders are always to aim high. Aim so high, as I think Steve Gallagher referenced last night, that it's beyond your grasp. Yes? If you can do it, it likely isn't so much of God, but of your own invention, of your own interests, desires, ambitions, hopes, dreams. But if it's beyond the end of your fingertips, it is truly of God to see the world whole, to see people's lives transformed, to participate with them by aiming high, that's what God does. God calls us to that which is beyond ourselves. I will be your God, you will be my people, and that relationship, that intimacy, is expected to transform you and to transform the world. We are a holy people. 
And here's the hardest thing, even as adolescents or young adults, we live now under the influence of a spiritual power and purpose outside of ourselves, and we actually no longer fit in the culture. And that is ultimately the hardest lesson to learn. As called people, we will no longer fit because we see the world through a different set of lenses. The lenses of God. The eyes of the sacred. I've spent countless years weeping over the brokenness that I am. And the brokenness that I see. Anybody who lived in State College knows if you spend any time from 11 p.m. to 3 in the morning in Calder Alley, which is where the students hang out, 11 p.m. to 3 a.m., I watch and I weep from time to time at what young people are doing to destroy themselves, thinking that it has no consequences. Dragging young women and young men across the streets, literally dragging them toward their housing. Hundreds of them at the hospital, so much so that the hospital was overborne with the weight of the suffering in this world as a consequence of your responsibility. We are a holy people set apart for the gospel and then for the well being of others. Next time we come. Spiritual leaders have to catch the wind of the love of God. In the biblical story, this is the Spirit of God. We call it Numa. And the Spirit of God enables us to be led and to be transformed. And that transformation is so profound that people begin to see that we are peculiar. That we are living counter culture. Lives. And I just want you to turn to your right or to your left and look how children these people really are. In the biblical sense of peculiarity, not in the sense that we often use the term, but in the biblical sense of the peculiar, you are right where you should be, right in this room pursuing something quite sacred, profound, and transformational. One of the things I did years ago was my exit interview from my master's program at the United Seminary. A lot of you have done this, and I will do it again and again. I went to the vice president's office, and I had my exit interview with Dr. Bainey, who reviewed all of my work for three years, my written work and my exams, he said, I have three pieces of advice for you. And I said, what's that? He says, well, first, I want you to know you're going to graduate. Is that good news? And you're going to graduate first in the class. That was really good news. I expected a huge monetary gift. Didn't get it. And then he said these things. I want you to put yourself in a position to be changed. Parentheses, my words, not in a position of arrogance, but a position to be changed. I want you to understand that you are to be of the greatest possible usefulness to Christ and the church, not the least you can get away with in culture. You see how this points to peculiarity. Put yourself under the influence of others who are sacred, who stood the test of time. Make yourself of the greatest possible usefulness. And whatever you do, Ed, when you leave this campus, always, always, always live for the well-being of others more than you live for your own well-being. And then the grand old man of the faith said, I want you to know, when you understand you are to live for the well-being of others, you will know that you're finally converted. Yes? yes? It takes a long time to get to that place where others are more important than you. But 
that's what makes saints and martyrs. Those who finally understand that it's not about me, it's about them, you, the others. Last slide, then we'll have to stop. Spiritual leaders also know what I think the British Methodists figured out a long time ago and didn't make it quite to America. But there are these five movements in the British Methodist Church that are pretty profound. We are called, or claimed if you like, gathered, gathered together with the community of the faithful, empowered by the presence of the Holy Spirit, given authority to use the name of Jesus, and to engage in winning the world to Jesus Christ. Those five movements, in many ways, are only possible if we keep in tension our fascination with structures and organizations and the nature of the Christian movement as God's power for goodness in the world. Some people end up losing their zeal, their enthusiasm for the Christian faith, by replacing the challenges of the movement with an obsession with the organization. For me, that has been a real, ongoing tension and a purpose is to understand the significance of structures. You couldn't have come here without a whole bunch of structures. So when people say, I'm against organized religion, my response is, as flippant as theirs, what is disorganized religion like? You can't go on a mission trip without global structures, passports, visas, governments, representatives all over the world laying the ground for you to go and meet. You can't get education without structures. You can't even get a meal with agricultural structures and the sacrifices of poor farmers who can hardly eat out a living. Structures are imperatives, but they are not the end. They are a means to an end. Keep in your mind, keep in balance as we bring this to close. <coughs> that your call to ministry is to create, in whatever form or way, the most effective organizations for the outcomes that change the world. And that must stay in tension the rest of your life if you're going to be a spiritual leader. It's been my joy to be with you. I hope this brings in some way, in some way, that which you've already heard. Spiritual leaders are set apart for the gospel, by the gospel, by the God of the gospel, for their own maturation, for the building of the community, and the sending of the people ultimately into the world. May God bless and keep you as your journey unfolds. I hope that this has been a helpful few moments. Amen.